You point out how data and uh, how it technically and, and technology is influencing our life. And you came in this today. I want to uh, point out to you guys here and open this up to you, AB, as well, because this is gonna. I want to open up this discussion. What is it again? Chat GPT. It's a term <laughs> I've never heard of, but sure. there are influences with our technology and just how the world is changing. And many times we're in the middle of that change. I'm one of the people. I have no idea the best way forward, at least what it is that we're being influenced by and also what we're feeding into. Uh, Ramesh, you were telling yeah, me about that. This is, this is the biggest hype in artificial intelligence in, in recent years. Um, but it really has actually almost nothing to do with either intelligence or even artificial intelligence itself. So I'm a former AI developer, uh, mainly because I was just studying engineering, because even though I'm into many other things. As a former engineer, we I used to build and, and study artificial intelligence systems. And what we did when we were doing that was we were interested in how the mind worked, how reasoning worked, and how do you build computer systems uh, to try to emulate that. That is not at all what this is. So I, you know, even the cause of AI should be questioned. Like, what's the point of it, right? Should we be building computers that can emulate humans? Um, what about other types of intelligence, like emotional intelligence, um, environmental intelligence, non-human intelligence? That's mm -hmm. a more out there idea. I think a lot about. So what does ChatGPT do? It's part of the Trojan horse, like what we've all signed onto, and we shouldn't feel bad about it. What we have been coerced onto as a default in this country and many parts of the world, which is indiscriminate data collection of us at all times. So that's not just us using the phone. That's not just us on Facebook or Instagram. When we use a credit card, when we get picked up by a surveillance camera, you know, when an Amazon vehicle passes us on the street, all of that is tracking and gathering data about us. So why is that important? Because all that data is being stored and computed and we have very fast pattern matching algorithms. Algorithms are rules written in code. You can basically write a question to the platform chat GPT and it'll spit out an answer. I could, you could say, write an essay about Cenk Uyghur, you know, mm -hmm. write an essay about the Young Turks. And But what will it spit out? It will spit out the most common patterns associated with that question. So what does that mean? That computer system is simply pattern matching. It's not actually reasoning, right? It's not actually thinking or reasoning or actually it's not what we call semantic, right? And what it also is is simply spitting out are the mass cultural patterns. So any ability for us to reason, to grow, to develop, to even be irrational at times, these systems are the opposite of that. And I also want to note that this system was created by OpenAI, which Elon Musk was involved in at the beginning. It was supposed to be this beneficial technology for humanity. And as soon as the hype of this blew up and Microsoft started pouring money into it, while Microsoft is cutting thousands of jobs, mind you, um, it's now, of course, a for-profit company. So this, I have been emailing with Noam Chomsky a little bit about it because I was very interested in what he had to say. He calls it high-tech plagiarism because all it's doing, it's it's a it's a game, it's a toy by which we can just be kind of by by we, and it's fun, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, you can spit out these patterns that are kind of uncanny, um, but it is not anything to do with humans. It has any, it's not anything to do with intelligence. It's certainly not a tool or a set of systems that we have power over uh, or are necessarily taking us or our youth in a great direction. Well, I guess the, the thought I had, and <laughs> I'm not sure if you were on this line, uh, AB, because I know nothing about these types of things. But my thought when I first hear, uh, we know there's indiscriminate data collection. I know every time I put yeah. my, my bank card in something that it's leaving an impression. Or every time I honestly gas stations and then you know there's cameras there, banks, any of these types of things, people are, are checking and, and continue with all your whole life. But is it possible to avoid it? Because you have people that say, oh, I'm off the grid, man. I live way out there yeah. where it's barely in the internet and I don't really do this and I pay in cash and all this stuff. But is, there, is it impossible uh, to get away from it or not participate in that system? I, I think the default is indiscriminate data collection, we need to accept that as the kind of current standard. I mean, I talk to people in Congress, including progressives, but even some centrists who are concerned about that and wanna have the default be the opting out of data collection of us. But you know, different countries have different privacy laws and so on. But I think the question is, is if we accept that data is constantly being collected about us by third parties, whether it's states or corporations, and that's being used to basically influence our lives and influence what we might buy, influence how we might feel, what we might think, then what I think the interventions need to be are about public interest, labor-centric, 
uh, health centric, like youth health centric, etc. Policies to regulate these types of systems, to audit them. We should be creating jobs of the future to ensure that these systems do not abuse our lives. And so for me, it's it's like even if you accept the de facto position that you know all this is being collected, that doesn't make us paralyzed or unable to act. I mean, I'm on a complete mission to try to do anything I can about this. So it not is even chat GPT, but the larger sort mm -hmm. of Trojan horse uh, that we've all entered into. Can it even be seen as a generally a negative thing though? I mean, is it negative? I yeah. think it's I think it's very negative mm -hmm. because I think part of being in a democracy is being able to separate myself, my private self when I go home, myself hanging out with you mm -hmm. and meeting you AB versus myself when I'm teaching at UCLA. We should have control over our identities in relation to the context with which we're part. That's not what's happening here. Everything's being collected all the time and we also know shady groups like data brokers are using psychographic algorithms to target us to make Man. us essentially drive, drive us pretty crazy. And things know? I feel like I and know That's what Cambridge stuff. Analytica I, um, did, other groups like that um, did. I, I, maybe a couple years ago now, I bought the uh, the Oculus. You guys know the Oculus Quest? The, the, the uh, what's it called? The, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, goggles. See, now yeah. my brain is yeah. saying AI, but it's, uh, it's the virtual reality, right? We call and it a human machine interface. That's the technical okay. term, yeah. yeah. So, and as <laughs> I had to set up the account, it goes through this whole thing and I'm seeing, choose an Avi, you're living in this particular living room. You look up, it's literally where you are. And then the TV in the living room, it was a TV and I can play YouTube videos, just like I'm watching on my TV at home and watching YouTube videos. And I said, I could sit here for an hour yeah. in this fake ass living room, <laughs> watching this fake ass TV, watching YouTube where I can watch it in real life on my couch, which I'm still sitting on in real life. And why would I want to do that? And then after doing that, how long will I be in here? And then after that, will I start living only as this AI that maybe I didn't want to have hair that day and I cut it off right. in the AI version of my life. And I start interacting with other people who are also sitting in there. Like, yes, this is when I'm becoming the old man going, yo, now we're starting to lose identity on actual human interaction. And it's an age old thing to say, but how close are we to that reality? I mean, pretty fun for us to play games and to enter different worlds. You know, there, I'm not inherently saying that like doing virtual reality or, you know, is 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 an issue or playing video games. It's more that, who knew? Did you know when you were wearing Oculus that everything was being collected right. about you while you had Oculus? Yeah, I assume so. That's the question. Still know the way the way in which you can avoid that. Once you bought it, it's I guess over. <laughs> well, it's part of Meta. I mean, it's one of their yeah. products, Facebook's products. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just. They're holding. Sorry, AB, I feel like I've. Yeah, sorry. No, <laughs> oh, it's okay. No, y'all were having fun in the conversation. <laughs> um, I guess I would just say, like, this is a, a conversation that's coming up in the legal field as well, mm -hmm. um, and more so on the benefits, right? So when you think about public defenders who have, you know, 700 uh, cases that they are trying to manage at one time. Producing all those um, memos and petitions and things like that could be fairly difficult on one person. And so I know the conversations have been coming up around how that could actually help our legal system and help kind of move things along in the legal system. Um, on the other spectrum, there is the conversation about its accuracy, right? Um, so I believe yeah. there was an experiment done not too long ago where um, a group of individuals questioned chat uh, GPT about like some Supreme Court justices. Right, and they had it take a law school exam, and I think um, it scored like a D minus or something like that. Right, <laughs> so it goes to show you the accuracy of these uh, of this type of intelligence and what we are using. So I think we have to be really careful and mindful of still using our critical thinking skills and research skills because that could be a problem where people are expecting a particular answer um, or a response from these machines, right, and not fact checking. And um, not doing uh, research and things for themselves, and now you're just believing everything you hear, even though it could potentially be false. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. I mean, we've seen a few different examples over the last few years that really show how, if you simply bow to these computational systems, what we call big data systems, just that just scrape patterns based on stimuli, mm -hmm. how it can end up uh, pushing out. A misogynist, racist, uh, essentially psychotic kind of outcomes, right? So, Google, uh, its image recognition algorithm had a was unable to tell the distinction between certain images of black people and gorillas. It started labeling them as gorillas. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, Microsoft created what's called a chat bot, which is like a bot that you put on Twitter to hang out and chat with people. Within three days, it started, it's, it's, it started turning racist, xenophobic, misogynist. And started hashtagging MAGA on it, um, and it had to be shut down. Right, yeah. so these this is why what we call content moderators, who should be people paid a living wage, who should be journalists, and it should be part of the economy of the future, are so important because they ensure the safety of these feeds. Do you know who are the content moderators for ChatGPT? Do you, Do you know by any chance, AB? Um, no. They're They're people be paid uh, one dollar an hour approximately in Nairobi, Kenya. And they will be phased out soon. And it's very similar to people who were doing this for Facebook. They were people in the Philippines who were encountering great amounts of PTSD because they were being exposed to the most heinous content. But why there? Why those folks? Cheap labor. Cheap Just labor. Strictly that, not cheap, because cheap then they, they're, they're, but the what decision making process based off of English speaking folks. country, no. cheap labor. And they mm -hmm. are an intermediate stage to a complete phase out of it. Because Elon Musk on Twitter wants to have no content moderators essentially, mm -hmm. or he's he said, we're gonna phase that out and we're just gonna give in to this system and technology will just be efficient, whatever that means. <sighs> I talk a lot about that movie. Uh, uh, I robot. <laughs> I never I saw know this that. Is different. The yeah. Not Smith even. One. How about Ak Machina? What, oh, that's one of my worse. favorites. I didn't see it. What's the, which one is it? Yeah, Ex I mean, Machina. It's, like, yeah, oh, yeah, Machina. yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, great. Sorry, one. I, I oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a good movie. But I think that's even more telling about where we're going in terms of technology and essentially how dangerous it could be if there is no moderation. On top of how dangerous the individuals that are creating these systems can become. That's why it's a huge opportunity for it to be driven by a certain set of values. And we need people who are civil rights oriented people, gender rights oriented people, journalists, people who care about the public interest. They should be working with technology companies. For me as a former engineer, uh, in none of my engineering classes do we learn any of this stuff. Even at UCLA right now, like all the computer science professors are like, hey Ramesh, we need an ethics class. Can you help us? Like, can you teach that class? Can, your, can we just have your class be the <laughs> ethics class? I'm like, what do you mean by ethics? Ethics is a trap door for everything that is not sort of blind technical engineering. But you, when you engineer for society and you don't have, you don't really know anything about society, let alone elevate the power of society, you engage in social engineering. <sighs> We all thought it'd be just, you know, purpose. I mean, there's some driven behind it where obviously you know the process, so you're not the only person in the world who does. And then oh, we're yeah. willing to accept Casey that. Newton, or, a lot of my colleagues, journalists, colleagues. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. just know how it's going to work, but then we'll accept it. Like you said, they're asking you to teach the ethics part, but who's the person who's against that being taught or that information being spread and people understanding yeah. the way these things really work? <laughs> well, good stuff. Um, uh, do, uh, one last thing though, you did mention you, you when you were traveling. And yeah. the reasons why these particular countries that you went to and your interactions with yeah. human face to face really fast. We have a yeah, I just got, um, I actually was on the damage report from uh, a temple town in South India. I was out of the country the mm -hmm. most of the last eight months on what they call a sabbatical. I was working on a new book, I was spending time in Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa and in India. And I was looking at examples of technologies of all types that people are creating that are not based on the individual because all of our technologies target us as individuals, mm -hmm. right? They collect data based on, oh, I'm gonna gather data about JR as an individual, your, all your historical data. But I was looking at examples of people building digital networks together that they own together. I was giving, I was taking examples from, and I'll talk about this more another time, people taking electronic waste or waste of all kinds and creating new value out of that waste, breathing life into things that are dead. So here's a crazy example, 3D printers are being built in Nairobi by by a, a by a bunch of entrepreneurs, street level entrepreneurs in, in Swahili, they call Jua Kali, which means mm -hmm. hot sun, and they're building those three D printers out of completely like dumpster diving, all all electronic waste, like chipboards from photocopiers wow. that are abandoned, even the plastic that the three D printers print from, they're able to turn into the resin that that printers use by by using convection and conduction, heating it and clamping it, so they are able to print. Thousands of microscopes that are in schools all over East Africa that never could have afforded a microscope otherwise because they built everything out of waste. 
And, be, and why are they doing that? I don't want to fetishize them. That is ex exemplifying a very unequal world. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's about the power of human creativity to guide and think about and conceive of technology in a way that we all really need to recognize right now with climate and so many other things. Whether we like it or not, we're kind of all in it together. So technologies that individuate us and atomize us and polarize us and isolate us are the exact opposite of that. So my new book is likely going to be about technologies that bring people together. And that's not about technology. It's never been about technology. It's about what we choose to stand yeah. for as human beings. And now it's all about the communication and interactions and all that. We don't think about it technologically wise. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, so really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.